know for a fact what they said. <coughs> so, suppose um, X is a, I hope you'll excuse me, complex projective variety. And uh, despite what you have seen in this, uh, in this uh, uh, workshop, this, uh, this school, uh, complex projective varieties are interesting. <laughs> so, um, N1 of X, that's a, a, a lattice, this is a, a, the, the image in in the uh, second cohomology group with uh, rational coefficients of the classes of uh, divisors. So it's, it's some lattice in, in some space. Some, uh, so, so this is some, some lattice in, uh, well, in its, in the associated vector space. So this is uh, sort of, uh, the, these are the cohomology classes of uh, up to, you, you forget all the, the stuff that is non-numerical uh, of, of divisors or divisor classes. And, um, and, lit, and lower one is the sort of the dual is the image of the classes of curves. So I guess classes of divisor of line bundles to, to kind of emphasize that this is cohomological and this is uh, homological. Uh, in H lower two, And of course, there's, uh, there's uh, this, the space in which it is contained. And the fact that I killed everything that is non-numerical means completely tautologically that these spaces in which these lattices lie are dual to each other. So. There's an intersection pairing, and if you wish, on the rational So this is a, the restriction of Poincare duality, and it's a perfect pairing. On this side. And um, So this is, uh, this is the, the, the lattice of line bundles. This is the lattice of curves and they're dual. And of, of course, when we study algebraic varieties, uh, what we learn in the beginning is we, we want, especially, so I should have said, yeah, I said projective. Projective doesn't say that it's in projective space. So we want to understand how it maps to anything, uh, in particular to projective space. And for that, we need li ample line bundles. So we have a cone and here's the rational version. This is a, this is a cone. If you take two classes of uh, an ample bundle and add them, namely take the tensor product of a line bundle, then it's ample. And, uh, so this is, and it's, so it's a convex cone. There's something on the level of curves as well. Um, and let me just mention that, that I can, I'll be interested in, in its closure in a little bit. 
and uh, there's something on the other side, which is just a class. So e, the n is just the same n, and e stands for effective curves. So we have two cones and, and kind of lattices in them. And these cones can be really uh, wild and weird. There are easy examples, for instance, for abelian surfaces where the cone is round and, and nice. And, uh, but there are, okay, so here's, here's the fundamental theorem of, on these cones and that's due to Kleiman. which says that I guess uh, uh, maybe I should uh, kind of suppress the cues. Well, never mind. I won't. Uh, ample, the closed ample cone and the closed cone of effective curves are dual to each other. Uh, namely, so what does this mean? I take the class of a, a line bundle and I ask what myself, is it in the closure of the ample cone? L is in the closure of the ample cone. In some sense, it means that its class can be approximated arbitrarily well by the class of an ample line bundle, although I took rational coefficients in order to do this. Uh, if and only if for any effective curve inside X, the restriction of L to C is non-negative. Now, this is a beautiful theorem. And, uh, you know, if, if I had the infinite amount of time, we'd just sit here five minutes and just contemplate it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> without closure, this Nakai Mosheson? Without closure, you have the Nakai Mosheson criterion, which requires not just uh, intersection with curves, but intersection with any subvariety, which is, uh, um, was proved by Nakai and Moshe's, and I think for surfaces and F, F, I don't think they proved it in general. I think it's in Kleinman's paper that it's proven in general. Even that. And it's proven in the right way. That's another thing. It's really a beautiful proof. I'm not going to prove it. Uh, this is uh, something nice we can give to your student as a, as a project to fit at the end of your uh, topics course in algebraic geometry, uh, geometry as, as indeed Brendan Hassett did uh, 13 years ago. I guess he's not in the course I taught. So. <clears throat> All right, so that's Kleiman's theorem. Okay, so uh, since we want to understand, okay, let me, let me tie a little bit with what people have, Remember, at least, at least yesterday, we had uh, one lecture where it was shown that even for arithmetic problems, you take an ar algebraic variety, you want to understand the rational points on it, it's often the case that you want to first blow down all the junk. You have a surface, might have some, some uh, minus one curves, you will want to blow them down uh, to get something simpler. So, contract whatever possible in X to get to something minimal. And in the lectures on surfaces, I'm sure there was mention on what a minimal surface is. 
Um, and the, uh, for a long time, the question stood, what is the right thing to do for, for higher dimensional varieties? Um, the, the theory, or the, the, theory, the birational geometry of, of surfaces was known in, since the beginning of the, the first half of the 20th century. By the end of the first half of the 20th century, Zariski wrote a book that summarizes it and everything is proven nicely. And you can, it has been republished, so you can actually read it. Um, but, but then what? You, you take a threefold, what do you do? Turns out that, that just like a minus one curves, the behavior of the canonical shift, and just like I did in the, this entire course, the behavior of the canonical shift is, is a crucial point. So if you have a line bundle, and so I'll, I'll concentrate not on the ample, but on, on this. This cone, the cone of curves. So remember, for surfaces, you blow up these very special rational curves, which are called minus, you blow down, you contract those minus one curves. So the idea is to look for very special curves that will tell you what you need to contract. And to look at the, one way to look at the cone of curves is to look at slices that are obtained by seeing what what the canonical bundle. So, so we can look at so this locus, which is the locus of, vec, uh, of elements in, in one of x, let's say q, such that, uh, so kx dot v is next. So that the class of kx, I mean, I think of kx as a class. Right? And you can intersect it with this, with this cone of curves. If you look at the theory, so the motivation comes from the theory of surfaces. This is explained in the in great detail in the book of Matsuki that is in, in the um, references of, of my notes. Um, if you look at the at this case of surfaces, you see that all these minus one curves lie on the boundary of this cone on this side, on this side. And they, they lie in a nice way. And, and the, the point of uh, this lecture is to explain why this is a general picture. So let's, so, so the claim is this is important because even for surfaces, it, it, you know, the, the minus one curves lie here and lie in a nice way. And we'll see in a, in a little bit. No, let me, let me just tell you. So the general picture is that this subcone this subcone is locally uh, polyhedral uh, away from the, the locus where, where in the, in, so, so here's the picture. Let's first draw the plane kx equals zero, the hyperplane kx equals zero, and we are looking for on it, at it from below. So I'm thinking of it, this is the, the it's lying here. And here's the origin. Let's intersect the, the cone of curves, of effective curves with this. And then there's the positive side, which is not, now, have they heard about colored chalks here? Well, I, I think I'll, I'll manage. I think I'll manage. So, so there's, there's this side, 
which is the positive side, which I'm not saying anything about. So I'm drawing it round because it, it could be round. There are examples where it is round. And also the intersection with kx equals zero, I, I don't have enough dimensions to draw it. It could be completely round, as in some examples of abelian surfaces. In abelian surfaces, this is not, the whole space is kx equals zero, right? And now we look at the, at the locus where uh, it's negative, and what I'm saying is that there's a, a countable collection of, of classes of curves that, the base, that they, they, they lie on this side, and they, they, don't, they don't have um, accumulation points on this side. They only uh, possibly accumulate near this plane. And the cone, is polyhedral on this side, as long as you don't get too near this. It, it has infinite structure as you get near to kx equals zero, but with the colors, it would be a little easier to see, but. I'm looking at rational, but it doesn't really matter. So the, this, this polyhedral locus, I'm saying it's generated by countably many classes of curves. So a class of a curve is integral. Above, it's, I, I, I've said it, it could be round. And round is definitely not rational. So this is, this is uh, the statement of the Cohn theorem, as I will state it in a, in a little bit. I want this on this side. And what I want to do is give you a suggestion of some of the ideas that go into the Cohn theorem and some of the conjectures that, uh, that lie around it. So this is just the beginning of the investigation. Once you are here, that's okay. I, I think I'm, I, I managed to draw a, a, a picture that is, thank you. Uh, so, so I want to give some, some of the ideas that go into, it, into proving that this is the structure and some of the ideas that go into results and conjecture that go beyond. And the goal is to, is, is what I want there. Which is still conjectured, but, but major advances have been made recently. So here's the lemma. Let C be a curve of genus bigger than, bigger equal to, to one. So uh, let me just point out one thing. So I, um, I'm saying we are studying the geom rational geometry of higher dimensional varieties, but I want to kind of stress the point that the geometry that we understand is the geometry of curves. So we are studying using curves, and we are studying curves on the variety, OK? So let C be a curve of genus 1. Let F be a, 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 a and, and B any curve with an open subset B0 inside B. And so I'll draw a picture in a minute. So, and let f from c cross b0 be a map to x. There's one more thing I forgot to fix. I fix a point in c. So that f restricted to, to, to p, namely f from p 
cross B0 is constant. So this is B0 inside B, so I'll draw here what, what's added to B. So this is a kind of a missing piece of C cross B, and I have a map from the open piece to X, so this is X, so the open piece is B0, cross, uh, C cross B0, and here's my P cross B0, such that the image of this, so it looks like, sort of like this, okay? So that this point sort of maps to a point. Then I claim, uh, so B, so B of any projective curve is open. Then I claim that, um, so, and assume F is non-constant. Then there is, then there is, is a rational curve um, what do I want to call it? Maybe gamma? Where is it? I didn't call it anything. Uh, then there is a rational curve, gamma, uh, inside x, such that f of p, which is so this, I'll call this f of p, which is a little misleading. It's f of p cross b0, but that's fine. It says this is in gamma. So, so what I claim is that, is again a point where, so here's a rational curve. Uh, yeah, 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 non-constant, um, neither on a fiber and non on the, not on the, so F cos, or circuit to each fiber is non-constant and, okay, so, so assume the dimension of the image of F is two. Do you believe me now? Okay. So wh why is this true? Let, let's think about it. Because of this condition that, that Franz now reminded me to add. So let, let's take an, uh, a, so, so image of F is inside X, and I can take, uh, it's, I can take the closure of image of F. And uh, there's some ample line bundle there. So, so, so F has some ample divisor. And I can easily choose D not to pass through F of P. Okay. Now the key point that uh, in order to prove this lemma is to say uh, that um, the map does not extend to a map from the product C cross B. So, so, I mean, you need to prove a little more than that. So let's convince ourselves that C cross B, so there's no map C cross B to X extending this. OK? 
Okay, so this is just an idea. Why is that? If I, if I would be able to extend it to a map from C cross B to X, then I pull back the divisor D that does not map through F, uh, not go through F of P, then the, the inverse image of the of the divisor D would look something like this, right? And it would not intersect P cross B. But the only product, the only divisors that have this property, are only effective divisors are the inverse images from the projection to C. So it's pi sub c upper star of some other divisor on c. So it would be just a bunch of horizontal lines. And that's, that's really impossible because uh, this, such, such a divisor, I mean, a pullback of something from a two-dimensional variety uh, has Codaira dimension two, whereas this, uh, this has Codaira dimension one. So, I mean, the, there are various ways to say the same thing. Now, uh, instead of, of course, this does not prove what I want. So where is the rational curve? What I, what, what I the, the, in order to prove this, what I do is I extend this map, and I can, at least after uh, semi-stable reduction, I can extend it to something, some other surface. After blowing up, I can always extend it to some other surface that does map to X. And uh, by the theory of semi-stable reduction, the only component that I will see are the original curve C together with some, some chains of rational curves. Now, if I only had the chains of rational curves attached at points other than this point, I would still be able to repeat this argument and get, get a contradiction. So the only way uh, I, I, I get away from this is if there is some you, there is some blow up pro, uh, pro, uh, processed at P that is necessary in order to extend the map. And the image, after you blow up, of this rational curve, after all you blow up uh, points on a surface, you get rational curves. The image would be a rational curve that, that meets the image of P and therefore it goes through the image of P. So that's, that's, that's this lemma. Now, Darmon does it much better. But <laughs> I will also need a little bit of an analog for rational curves mapping. So this is only for curves of genus bigger than one. And of course, for rational curve, the theory of semi-stable reduction is different. So I need something different. So here's the lemma for rational curves. If you think about rational curves, what you need is, is two points mapping to. Um, so lemma. Uh, C is now P1 and B as before. And assume that they have f from c cross b naught to x such that the restriction to two distinct points is constant. And that the dimension of the image is again 2. And then, um, Then, uh, so the claim is that, that, uh, that the class of the curve breaks into two pieces. I'm not going, it's go, it goes either through one of the, okay. so 
then there is then the class of f of c, well, the class can be written as a class of c1 plus c2, where these are non-zero classes of rational curves in x. So the, the class is not irreducible, that's what I'm saying. Non-zero classes of rational curves. And I can also say that they pass through, uh, through the one through one point and one through the other point, but that's not. So the picture is, instead of that, here's x. Here I have two points, and I have my rational points kind of bending, bending, and at the end, they'll have to break. And the proof is the same. You just have to be a little more careful. I haven't been careful anyway, so. Maybe I should just keep this picture up. So now, so now uh, a little bit of, of deformation theory. Luckily, after Wiles, uh, you are allowed to mention deformation theory in a conference where, uh, where number theorists sit. Um, so there is deformation theory started, well, it, it it has a long history in algebraic geometry, and um, in particular, you can, uh, if, if you look at a space of all curves of a given class, you can as, uh, estimate its dimension using cohomological methods, just as Wiles does later on. Um, so suppose I have a map from a curve x, a morphism. Then uh, I have for myself a summary here. And I have, uh, let's say, k points on the curve. No, I, I, my notation is n. Then I want to estimate the dimension of the deformation space at this map f. Which fix. The, of those maps that fix this, the points P1 through Pn. And there's a simple cohomological argument that says that this is, um, uh, this is bigger or equal to the Euler characteristic on C of F upper star of the tangent bundle of X twisted by minus the sum of the points in question. And you can, by riemann roch you can write that down numerically. So Wiles was not the, the first one to do such things. Um, this is a telling number. Well, I'm not done, of course, but. So it's minus the degree of the, the canonical divisor class on x restricted to the curve, plus numerical, uh, the usual things that come into. So d max is just the rank of this vector bundle, and this is the degree. This is the usual riemann roch X was always a smooth projective variety. It was there. It, you don't see it anymore. <laughs> so in particular, let's look at this lemma 
I want to be able to say that, uh, that uh, maps that pass through two points have an image of dimension two, and that will, will uh, tell me that, that the curve will break in the rational curve case. So let, let, let's, let's assume for the time being, for simplicity, that we have a Fano variety that, well, the time being is this lecture. So let's assume for the duration of the, uh, the, the sketches of proofs that I'm giving you that Kx, Kx is ample. Otherwise, you need to, um, to uh, do some, you need to choose another ample bundle to be able to measure things with respect to it, and it's a little more technical, and I, I don't want to go through it. So, so let's take a rational curve and ask ourselves, uh, what do we need in order to ensure that the class of this curve breaks? So say C is rational, and say minus kx dot c is bigger or equal to d max plus 2, then this means that the dimension of the, this means that the dimension of the deformation f, ref, f restricted to two points, uh, it's uh, minus So I ju you just plug in there. G is 0. Uh, N is 2, so you have here minus dim x, and that's the minus dim x there, and this is the other term. So minus kx or minus kx? Minus kx example. Thank you very much. So let's assume that we have a chance of finding, uh, finding um, like in surfaces, minus 1 curves. This is, this is absolutely crucial. You want to, so the, the, in some sense, varieties where kx is ample are varieties where you don't expect to blow down anything. You don't expect to contract anything. Like in the case of surfaces of general type, you take their minimal models. Um, so we look at the, say this is ample. So we assume that this is so ample that, that it's bigger than this then this means that the dimension of the deformation space is at least two. Now let's assume that C is not just, that we don't have just a map, but C is inside X. So in which way can a curve inside X, uh, um, the map from, the, from P1 uh, that embeds the curve in X, deform keeping two points? Well, there's still a C, a, a C star, a GM, for the arithmetic, arithmetician. There's a C star moving uh, the P1 fixing two points. Think about the points at zero and infinity. You just mul rescale the curve. But, but that's just one dimension. And if the, the formation space is two-dimensional, the curve has to move. <clears throat> so this means that the curve breaks as Now, the reason I, I assume that minus k is ample is because minus kx is ample, each one of these is positive, so, so, I, I, so they're both uh, positive, and, and, and now I have an inductive force. If I start with something with too big a degree, then I can break it. So what does this mean? What does this mean is that there exists a, so if there is a curve like this, if then there exists a rational curve with minus kx dot c less than or equal to d max plus 1. Uh, it has to be less than this. Okay, so this is, this is part of, so remember this. So we, we still have the, so, I want to claim that such a curve always exists. So how, how do you do that? And that's, 
So how, this is all, by the way, this is all work of Mori so far. A priori, on a projective variety, I don't know that I have a rational curve. What I do know is because the variety is projective is that there is a curve. I slice it with hyperplanes until I go down to a curve. So every projective variety has a lot of curves. In fact, the, the cone of curves is dual to the ample uh, cone, so there have to be many, many curves. All right, so, so let, let C be any curve. All I need to do, so what the first step, this step above tells me is, I, all I need to do is produce a rational curve. Once I have a rational curve, I'll know that there's a small rational curve. I, I should just point out that under these assumptions, this minus kx dot c is, is sorry, strictly positive. So, so I, I actually have the curve completely completely under control. So I just need to find one rational curve. This is like a problem that we have been doing here, find rational points on varieties. So how do you, and this is, this is really spectacular. So let, let's see what, what, the, what that tells us. Uh, so the, the, the estimate on the, you know, I want, I want the image to be at least one dimensional when I have one point. So let's put n equals one here by the first lemma. n equals one, so this cancels with this. So I want, so c is again inside x, oh, the curve in x, I want minus kx dot c, which I know is positive because minus kx is ample, minus g times dim x, and I want this to be bigger or equal to, uh, 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 bigger or equal to 1. You know, a non-rational curve, that, uh, I cannot deform it within itself, so any deformation, if I have at least one, will push it out and the image will be two-dimensional. All right, so, this term is, is really troublesome. If the curve were rational, we could think about taking a double cover and maybe a co compensate for having deformations of the double cover by having a lot of deformations. But if, the, if a curve is, is of genus bigger than one, any branch cover, the genus will only grow. And if you do this, this exercise, you'll see that you'll never win. Never ever win. So this is where a really spectacular idea uh, comes in. Mori says that it was suggested to him by Hironaka. So, but you know, su suggestion is not the same as proving a theorem. So the theorem is, is, was proven by Mori. So what, what, what this spectacular idea says is, you have a variety of complex numbers, a projective variety of the complex numbers. It can be defined over some finitely generated field, which you can spread over some finitely generated ring over Z, and then you can reduce mod P, okay? The, the arguments of deformation work out fine. And when you reduce mod P, you can replace C by its Frobenius cover, which has the same genus. The Frobenius cover of a curve has the same genus, so I can form the curve CM which covers the original curve C by the mth power of Frobenius when I reduce to, uh, yeah, and, <coughs> and I get a curve with the same genus, but sin since I, I have a, uh, so the degree here is P to the M. So I have a cover of a curve by degree P to, this is multiplied by P to the M. So I can make this as big as I want, and therefore I can make this bigger equal to one. 
So what does this say? Is if I reduce the variety mod p, and let's take the locus, uh, th those reductions which are still smooth and nice, and yeah, then um, then this will deform, and there will be a rational curve model of p. But those are rash, so so reduction mod p exists a rational curve C p on x p, so the reduction of x mod p. I'm being a little, uh, this is a little sleight of hand. I need to choose a point on the spectrum of the ring of definition and so on and so forth, but uh, you're all number theorists, you know what I'm saying. Okay, so there is a rational curve. So here's x and here's xp. There's a rational curve here, a rational curve here, a rational curve here. For any reduction, so th the fibers are, for any reduction I have a rational curve, but that's not enough. That does not mean that I have a rational curve over characteristic zero. What is enough is that I have a bounded rational curve. And that's where I, I that's a crucial point, that I have a rational curve of degree at most, the canonical degree is, is bounded. Rational curve, so minus kx dot cp is positive. I, I can choose the reduction so that this is still ample uh, for infinitely many p, and this is less than d max. Now I can use the theory of Hilbert schemes that, that Grothendieck defined for us. So there's a Hilbert scheme parameterizing any bounded sort of uh, uh, of curves. So this bounds the Hilbert polynomial of the curve, and therefore there's a finite type Hilbert scheme over spec of the ring of definition. Yes? Yeah, so, so, I, so originally, so, uh, so, so the argument just says there is a rational curve. But I p apply that argument again, the ar argument for rational curves. I found a rational curve of huge degree. But, but the argument for rational curves says that if there is a rational curve, there's one of bounded degree. It's not the same one. So the, Hilbert, the theory of Hilbert scheme says that, that I, have, I have these infinitely many rational points over all reductions on a, on a single Hilbert scheme, sorry. So the Hilbert scheme is not empty. In, uh, in all these reductions. But the Hilbert scheme is a finite type, so the, if it's not empty for all these reductions, then it has a generic fiber which is non-empty. At, At least one component of that Hilbert scheme is non-empty. So if I look at the Hilbert scheme, the Hilbert scheme might have exotic components lying in characteristic P1, characteristic P2, and so on. But what this says is that there there's, there's a point, but the, this is a finite type. So there's at least one component of the Hilbert scheme that looks like this. And it has a generic fiber, therefore, it, therefore of the complex numbers, it has a point. I don't know that it has a rational point, but at least I know that uh, after an extension, there is. So, so the, the generic fiber has a point. So what, what is that point? That's a class of a curve inside, a rational curve inside X of degree at most degree x plus 1. And now I can state the cone theorem, which luckily I, I left the, the picture. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll state the, th the cone theorem so that it will, uh, it will fit with that picture. And the cone theorem, so you need a little more arguments when kx is, minus kx is not ample. You need to be a little more uh, careful, but the cone theorem says that if x is a smooth projective variety, then there is a countable collection 
CI of, of classes of curves CI uh, where CI are rational curves and they are discrete in, in the so, my, so KX dot C is negative and they are CI is negative and they are discrete in this half, half plane such that the cone of curves, any, it can be written as, as the, the round piece, the, the, the KX positive piece, I'll write it this way, KX bigger or equal to zero, uh, maybe with a Q, uh, plus uh, this sum, uh, I guess I did everything over Q, then I might as well uh, leave it. Uh, plus the cone generated by this countable collection. So this is the cone theorem. So there's a, there's, a, there's a side of the cone on which we have no control. The ne kx negative is, is, is uh, locally polyhedral and generated by classes of rational curves. Okay, so now I want to state, uh, so this is just, one step in a minimal model program. Here's an important uh, other theorem that you can prove. So you take one of these CI, and the claim is that these are like minus one curves in many respects. Then you can you can contract them. You can contract precisely those curves, each one at a time. So the contraction theorem says that um, Contraction theorem is that for every i, there exists a map from x to some yi. So this is a normal projective variety. Such that uh, um, the relative Picard number is 1. Uh, so, uh, let me write it like this, it has rank one. So, so, uh, it, so what, whichever line bundle is ample on the fibers is, uh, okay, and such that, maybe I should, I should copy uh, the theorem from what I wrote. So this is C. So I'll call the 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 Q times CI. This is the this is the ray in the in the cone, a boundary ray, which is called RI. It's called an extremal ray. So what? So CRI, and what I'm saying is, so uh, this, this morphism has connected fibers. CRI has connected fibers. And uh, moreover, I can tell exactly which curves, uh, which curves are contracted. And a curve, Uh, what do I call that, that other curve? A curve D inside X maps to a point 
under this map CRI, if and only if the class of that curve is in this ray generated by CI. So, of, of course, if you contract the curve, you can con you contract any multiple of that curve if, if, if this curve moves enough so that you can put the multiple. But, for instance, there are cases where you can contract a P2, and uh, the, the, the generator of that thing is, is just a line in P2, but, of course, there are other curves in P2 which are equivalent to a multiple of the line. So... This C is, means that, that, that these, these extremal rays can be sort of killed one by one. And what, something happens when you do that. The Picard number is reduced exactly by one. So now I can state the minimal model conjecture. I can state what this implies and what the... Basically, there are, there are three cases. So one case is when this contraction map, where the dimension of yi is smaller than the dimension of x, so there are fibers. Then this means that x is, is uh, covered by classes of curves uh, in the class of C. Well, you need to worry about it a little bit, but in fact, X is unirule in that case. X is covered by rational curves. So this is sort of understood. <coughs> There's a reason why uh, KX was not positive. Uh, the second case is the dim yi, uh, so dim yi equals dim x, and this breaks into two subcases. Case one, case Roman numeral one, uh, is uh, where the exceptional locus is a divisor. And then well, I only know that yi is, uh, is a normal variety, but the theory has been extended, although not as beautifully as what I've told you. There's no reduction to characteristic p and stuff like that. The theory has been extended, and in fact, you can continue. You can replace x by this yi and continue. The, the second case is the trouble case, is where exceptional locus the exceptional locus have, has higher codimension, is not a divisor, and in this case, it's just impossible to replace x by yi. Yi is way too singular, and what you do in this case is, is what, uh, what's called a flip. So there was an extremal way ray which was contracted, so minus kx dot, dot ci was negative here. This is a, a small contraction as well. The exceptional locus is again small, and the curves that, that minus, k, uh, sorry, not minus, kx dot ci is negative. Did I write minus where I shouldn't have? So minus kx dot ci was positive, so kx dot ci. So here, kx dot ci, this time, is positive. So you got rid of some of the negativity. The only problem is that this is a conjecture. So this is in case two, which, is, which says that conjecturally, there's something else where you can replace x by x plus. And uh, it's known in dimension three. It's now known also in dimension four. And is it known in dimension five by this Alexev Kawamata? Or is this still, is it? Yeah. Into the, prob into the side of probability. 
Okay, so there's a paper that, that I think basically says that <laughs> maybe there's a small technical problem, but I think it's now known uh, due to work of Shokurov, uh, Haken, McKernan, and Alexeyev, Haken, uh, Haken and Kawamata, that um, it works in dimension five, I think. So what this allows you to do is finally get to a minimal model. Maybe I'll erase here. So this procedure, you start with your x, where kx was not, was, was negative on something, and you start getting rid of these things where kx is negative on something, either by doing the contraction, if it's divisorial, or doing the contraction and finding a flip, if, if you manage to do that. And after finitely many steps, so conjecture, the procedure is finite. Which is kind of obvious if only contraction existed because you reduce the Picard number. In the flip case, you have to really work hard to show that the, this thing stops somewhere. So this is the termination of flips and this is the existence of flips. And the, th the, the conjecture is that this is finite and you get to ever which says that um, some, uh, some multiple of, of kx min has a base point free space of sections. Some big multiple m times k x min is base point free. This is called the abundance conjecture, and together, this, uh, all this thing together is the good minimal model program, uh, which implies, in particular, the minus infinity conjecture, implies semi additivity of Kodara dimensions, it implies a lot of beautiful things that I have suppressed. Uh, it, they are a little more prevalent in the notes than in my lectures. So I think this is a good time to stop.